Hi, I'm James Van Osdell. I host the nightly Carcone Carne podcast, which you can hear everywhere and watch on YouTube and Facebook. I'm joined by Brent Sopel. Brent is a retired professional hockey player. As a defenseman, he played professional hockey in the NHL, KHL, and AHL. And in 2010, he won the Stanley Cup with the Chicago Blackhawks. Brent Sopel is dyslexic. He is the founder of the Brent Sopel Foundation. And though he's known for playing professional hockey, he'd like for his legacy to be that he did everything within his power to assist dyslexic children everywhere. Our guest this week is a dangerously funny, super talented actor, comedian, writer, director, TV host. You may know him from Community, or The Soup, or his stand-up, or Spy Kids, or Ted, or the underappreciated National Lampoon documentary, A Futile and Stupid Gesture, or the White House Correspondence Center from 2014, or even Tiger King and I, even though we're trying to forget everything that happened in 2020. Sorry, Joel. As far as my kids are concerned, the only thing that matters is that on the CW Star Girl, Joel McHale is the original Starman, member of the world's first superhero team, the Golden Age Collective known as the Justice Society of America, the JSA. Starman is our guest. He is Joel McHale. Hello, Joel. Hello, Brent Sopel. This is always a good interview when you when the host freezes into a computer matrix. Yeah, this is this is our new way of life, isn't it? Is Joel, good. you you learned about dyslexia <laughs> later in life. I mean, that was within the past. It was a twenty first century discovery for you, right? Twenty first century. Indeed. Uh, yeah, I mean, clearly I could not read, but my son got diagnosed, and that's when I learned my diag. That was like, oh, that's me. As the as the doctor was describing the symptoms. And, uh, and, I, and she was like, oh, yeah, I was wondering which one it is because it's passed down. And, uh, and I said to my son, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, I, it's, I don't think it was denial of it. It was more just kind of like, I'm not good. I, I, and I, it's weird that because I'm a person that usually engages that stuff pretty heavily. Maybe I'm not. Uh, uh when something did you know what the word was when you heard it oh yeah yeah i knew about oh yeah i knew about it and i i suspected it and as soon as and i knew and my dad definitely has it even though he says he doesn't or he's like maybe uh because he's as slow of a reader and as bad of a speller as i am uh but so yeah it made it obviously now the resources for dyslexics are so much greater yeah. Uh, but when I was a kid, uh, I did all sorts of testing because they were like, he's smart, but he can't read. Uh, but I was told, though, I'm literally told I was a slow starter in second grade. And I told. Uh, and what, what's that mean? I mean, you're, it means basically they're calling you an idiot. Uh, yeah. And uh, I told the doctor that. And she just her reaction was just this. Just like put her head down and said, like, I cannot believe they told a kid they were slow. And I was like, yep. Uh, oh, what are the three words? Dumb, stupid, and lazy we hear all, you know? Yeah. It, uh, I liked hearing it from, like, a education professional <laughs> that I was not smart. Yes. That was a nice touch. How'd uh, you get through college? I cheated. Perfect. Uh, very Love to hear that. I, I cheated. I didn't, I mean, also, I mean, there was a side of me that, uh, you know, the rebellious side of me that was like, oh, fuck it. Well, if I'm not good at this, I'll go do something else. I don't need to do this. And, you know, you resent it because uh, you're jealous of other people being able to yeah. kind of, uh, but yeah, so I just kind of did, uh, the only thing, the subject I cared about in school was uh, history. And I could do that because it was a lecture and I could, I was better than anybody gleaning stuff from a lecture, but uh, yeah, so I just ignored, I didn't ignore school. I just figured out how to get through it by cheating and getting good. And I got really, I ended up with pretty good grades, uh, but I was a good cheater because I didn't, I would never get an A. I made sure I never got an A. I just was like, keep it at B or B minus or a C plus and people will go, what idiot is not trying to ace this thing if they're cheating? Uh, Cause I knew that that was a surefire way to, there were some places I couldn't cheat like languages. You can't really, 
cheat that way other than if it's a written thing and then I would just figure out how to look on look, make a deal with somebody to look on their test uh but that's what like when I got to the SATs I was not smart enough to get somebody to take them for me I, I've had I have a friend who's super he's very innovative had a guy take him take the SATs twice for him uh to the point where the guy had a license made with the other guy's face on it and they <laughs> and they and he, and he aced the test uh twice uh but um yeah i got like just once twice i got to combine it was before the sat had three parts and it was just two parts and i got to combine like eight ten or something it was terrible uh so i and then i did the same thing in college because i always felt like respond i was like well i should probably i have to go to college you have to have a degree or you'll be uh you know a drug addict that was kind of drum you know drummed into me um but i understand the impetus to go to college it is a good it, for some people, many people, it's a good place to find out what you want to do. For me, I knew what I wanted to do, and it was just another obstacle to get around it. Um, but uh, so that's where, and then I, I, so I cheated. I did a, I, that, I knew college was not joking around, and cheating uh, in college was serious. So I had to get really good at it. See what I did there, guys? I did not learn my moral lesson. Hashtag uh, role model. Well, that's no, that's a prime example of a dyslexic doing whatever it takes to get through. Right. So I knew that I couldn't read. And so I just, and I poured myself into athletics and into performing. So that's, that's what I was planning on. Uh, and I didn't, and you know, all my, I, I didn't want to, I wasn't, I knew it wasn't going to like all my friends became lawyers and I was just like, I, that would that would be doubling down on a shit sandwich for me. So uh, I didn't do that uh, anyway. But I I don't I, I don't recommend it because now there's so many things. There's so many resources now for dyslexics, and I now I'm going back with Audible and listening to all the books that I refuse to read. Uh, so uh, I really have enjoyed that, and I and uh i again i can i can tear i mean it's like i'll i'll see books that'll be like oh this is a 21 hour book which means that i'll be done with this book in 21 days or 20 days because I'll, I'll listen i always listen when i work out uh or in the car so not that i'm in the car all the time now but um yeah i i count it now as an i mean you guys know it i mean i count it now as an advantage of seeing the world in a different way and seeing the educational system as a very as for very just a very uh, typical person that is uh, not a very big group of people, and uh, I think you know this is a larger conversation. But American education is design is not designed for dyslexics or people with attention uh, the issues. Ironically, so many boys have both of those things in spades that I don't know how I don't know how any yeah, yeah. non school schools made for girls anyways. Not for us. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, when you that, that one of kids? what? Or both? Do both your kids have it? Or what? both? Yeah, both do. Which is just such a nice gift. Um, How are they doing now? Oh well, Zoom school is a disaster, and uh, yeah. I mean, it's talk about putting another layer of just bullshit on top of bull. I mean, it's just like, come on. Now you gotta. Yeah. I mean, you guys know after this, after this little thing we're doing, you want to take, you, you need a little break because you're, yeah. you're, you're, you really are like the attention you're putting into it, looking at it as opposed to, I mean, I, yeah, I would have done so much better in high school if I could have just walked around during class. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, it's no fun. Uh, and the kid, like one of my kids is just like hates it. And I was like, yeah, this is, I was yeah. like, just, we got to count this as kind of a lost year and uh but we find other ways to to educate them but uh, to, yeah to educate them and i mean he he can tell you every single starting quarterback in the nfl and their backups and probably the third string <laughs> he knows that the offenses and the defenses better than i ever did when i played football so how is he athletic wise is he you know is he good you know for me my spatial awareness, because of my dyslexia, is why I played as long as I did. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, think. I mean, you think about your 
and myself, like I had got to, I, I always wanted to act and you want, and, and, and be in sports, but you obviously uh, were of the right athletic caliber to play in the NHL. Uh, but I, I always feel bad for the kids that don't have another outlet that they want to go into. Cause if a kid really is interested in law and they're dyslexic, it is so much harder. So, yeah. uh, you know, we were both interested in things that didn't require a ton of reading or a ton of, yeah. but I think, yeah, I, but that, that lawyer that who, uh, who is dyslexic will definitely see, will see the law differently than somebody who's typical. And, and that's the you know, prime example of why, you know, I'm trying to do that foundation to support that kid. You know, you had, you had an outlet. I had an outlet. If I didn't have the outlet, I would, I would, I would be dead. Be, right. Because you would have gone into stunt flying? I'd be dead. You know, so trying to support. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're uh, obviously very fortunate that, and because as you also, as you know, I mean, I can name a hundred people that were better actors than me that I knew. And you can name a hundred better athletes, but the drive to do what we want to do is almost as equal to your ability to do it. So, uh, uh, I, so that, that, that also, we are very lucky that we had that or somebody put that into us. 100%. It was cause I, you know, I wanted to be on the hockey rink cause I didn't want to be in, you know, anywhere near a book. Yeah. Uh, you know, I always count I as, that. There's a reason why, I mean, there's the whole, like, there's a reason why dyslexia is a thing and by, by anything, any disease or disorder came about and uh, they think it's because with dyslexics, they were the, the scouts that would go out and see the world differently and look at things not in a typical way because they couldn't sit in the village and uh, do regular work. They had to run around and get out and they had to, uh, they had to go see, see the, see where they were in a different way. So same thing with like, uh, they're like, why is diabetes a thing? And I don't know if you've read all that stuff about how they, they were able to prove the diabetes. Uh, there was a, it was in Denmark during World War II, a village was cut off from food by the Nazis. And there was like numerous women that were pregnant already. And the information the babies were given, the, the fetuses were given that was like, oh, we live in a world where there is no food. And they think, they like half those kids came out with diabetes because they think that diabetes is a was a thing that ancient humans needed in cold weather climates with or scarce food food climates because they could heat their their blood was heated more than a regular human beings to keep themselves warm and they could retain more calories i mean it was just like this crazy thing so it, i once they they think it's because we were scouts i think i could be Talking out of my ass, which I have before. Well, you know, as a dyslexic, you know, and then, you know, being on E, did you make your own scripts? Now we're talking about talking out our ass. Did you make up your own scripts or were you reading a teleprompter? I was reading a teleprompter, but the oh, first well, first the first year, I'm especially in the first six months, uh, it wasn't live. Uh, and it took me four hours to get through about twenty five minutes of jokes. I mean the show yeah. went to forever because I could barely read it and it and also there was a ton of anxiety surrounding me reading out loud in front of people and uh that was so much pressure and anxiety and stress and hi I, uh and did, did you get food yet all right uh did you want to play football yeah. all right we will after this uh uh, what am I saying? So, but as you know, as a dyslexic, you get, you eventually learn to read. It takes a long time and it takes slower, but you do. Um, so with the more I did it and the, the, the pressure and the more, uh, the pressure kind of alleviated, um, of, oh, I have less anxiety, which allowed me to read better, but I screwed up all the time, every single show. And we would either have to go back and get it or 
we would just leave the mistakes in. Then we began doing the show live and I would promote the show saying, I'm dyslexic, so I don't know how this is gonna go. Yeah. Uh, and that also gave me great sort of like, it was like a, a pressure valve release to go, oh, you're acknowledging it, you're letting it go. And so like Ken Jong and I hosted the Fox New Year's Eve special uh, a couple weeks ago and that was three and a half hours of live television of reading. And I was thinking about like, wow, I have come so much, it's taken me since 2004 to kind of get to this point where I can go, oh, I don't have any anxiety about it and I can read and I'm gonna, and I, and I think it was like, I'm gonna screw up and that's great, it's part of the show. Part of your timing and watching you on the Joel McHale show on Netflix, watching you on, uh, on The Soup, it's, there's a lot of physical joke telling where you don't say a word, your reaction, your, your, your face has a certain pliability when you respond to what you're showing on the green screen. Is that just naturally who you are in part of your comedic delivery? Or is that born of the fact that you're buying time to read what was on the cue cards? Uh, that's the drugs kicking in. No, uh, that's, no, that would be just me. Uh, I think there's that, but I, I, I believe me, when those scripts, when we would write the script and half an hour to an hour before the show, I am poured over that thing. And I am saying words out loud and putting them together and making sure like this. And if I kept screwing up a word, I'm like, guys, we got to replace that with something else. Cause I'm going to, I'm going to hit that thing and be, I'm, I'm going to know that word's coming and ignore everything else. But as far as my reactions, those are, those are natural reactions uh, were that, that show's been off the air for now six years. So. Uh, 12 seasons. 12 seasons. Yes. That's uh, awesome. I think they did, but they brought it back this year. I don't know how it's doing. Um, uh, uh, anyway, so yeah, that's my natural kind of reaction. Uh, uh, maybe a little heightened because of, because it's on television and I'm all amped up, but, um, but yeah, it wasn't there, there, I, during the clips, I would, the teleprompter, Per Michelle would, you know, she would zip the, you know, she would zip the joke really quickly for me to see and then go back to the beginning so I could, I could make sure. And I screwed it up all the time and I would just go like, yeah, whatever, let's just move on. And that's how I usually went. Are you able to look at yourself and say you're proud of yourself to get to where you are today? Because to have no, no one that uh, on no. live TV, yeah, that's, that's amazing. That's I'm proud of you. No, yeah, oh no, I would say that I, it took me a forever to read, but I definitely proud that I learned how to do it and I overcame. I mean, I, I no one ever, I never, like my son's mocking me right now, just mocking <laughs> me, talking. Uh, tell, him, tell him to stick his face in here. Let me tell you. Tell him to say hello. No, no. Isaac, you want to make five bucks? He's not going to come over. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm very proud that I did. And then. Uh, cause that was a major hurdle in my life. Uh, and, but I still, that doesn't mean, I mean, someone will send me a 110 page script and I'm just like, okay, give me a while. It's going to take me a while to get through this. Uh, so, um, I, I still have the reading problem. You know, I get an email and I get scared to open it up where I have to read it. Right. It just, yeah. I mean, now my, everybody's, uh, we, <laughs> my kids are throwing things at me. Uh, I don't get scared. I just kind of go like, yeah, I'll get to it. I'll get to it at some point. And then people are like, did you get my email? And I'm like, I'm sure I did. <laughs> I'm sure it came. I'm sure it's there. Did you read it? I'm sure I might have, but I don't, I, I didn't, I can't. It's hard to track the whole thing. Yeah. So, you know, and that's the, you know, and that's, you know, the foundation and you coming on or it's this conversation that only 20% of us understand what that means. Everybody else is like, yeah, open it up, read it. Mm, yeah, it's not that easy. They're like, yeah, it is. No, it's not. Yeah, I'm also endlessly distracted because I uh, <laughs> my ADHD is pretty heavy, and my wife will tell you that in a very long. The fact I'm really drowsy right now, so it's able. I'm able to focus. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, I know I. 
it is a weird thing and thank god for for audible because i would not read any of i wouldn't be like the i finally read crime and punishment about five years ago or four years ago and i was like this book was great i loved it and i was like i never would have done that i never would have read it never can we distract you with some career related questions yes as long <laughs> yeah as long as my kid is like come play football now <laughs> Tell them, five, tell them five minutes and you got me, Dad. Five minutes? Come on. Uh, you know, I was re-watching the correspondence dinner you hosted back in 2014, the, those simpler days when you could get up in front of a president and make fun of him, like, from five feet away. Uh, I, my lasting impression of that is, oh, my God, I'm glad Joel McHale's still alive after that. Yeah, well, nowadays, who knows? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm glad I survived that evening. Uh, uh, my, uh, yes, no, I would, uh, I was that is at that time you know it showed you that how badass america is that a comedian can get up and make fun of the most powerful person on the planet and not be put into a work camp right and that shows you the level of power and uh maturity that america had at that point and and for years of that uh and allowed that and that was so cool and I, I look back on that as such a highlight of my career, obviously. But now, and we knew, I don't care what your politics are, but if you can't take a joke, that is a real problem. And we saw with Seth Meyers when he made fun of Trump mm -hmm. at the correspondence dinner, he was, Trump was angry, which for a comedian, when you are in an audience or you have an audience at a club or a theater and you get to somebody and you actually affect them and they're not, they, they will not take a joke. That's a win for the comedian. Right. That's, that's like, you got them. And Seth got them with what, and so he's, uh, so again, I don't care what your politics are and you, and I will win this argument with you. That's not a good way to win an argument with us saying I'm going to win an argument. Can't, if you can't take a joke, you have to do some serious self-examination. And the, oh. reason, the reason why I bring the correspondence center up, there's a certain fearlessness I think you have to have as a comic, as an actor, which you clearly have. I mean, would you agree that that's part of launching into this world is you have to have a little kind of reckless, we're just going to make this happen spirit? Yeah, uh, I would say so, yes. But I, but like, I was always the kid that was jumping off roofs and... I've had like seven concussions and a skull fracture. And I was the kid when I would ski, I'd be like, I think I can take that jump. And uh, so, yes, much to my physical, much to uh, Mr. Sopel's health as well, you kind of go like, I'm going to see, I'm going to try it and see if I can do it. Uh, but yeah, with that, when, when acting or performing kind of opportunities come up, I, I, and I, and, I ha and I have a halfway notion that I can accomplish it, then I usually say yes. Um, there's something that I'm like, oh yeah, I don't think I could do that. But for the most part, I'm just gonna see if I can do it. And that was definitely, I mean, the minute I accepted that thing, I was nervous and I was like, oh, here we go. Yes, this is, this is, this is, the big, this is a big deal. And I need to pre start preparing now. And it, I've never been more prepared for anything in my life. We talked about the soup, and then there was the Joel McHale show with Joel McHale, which was unceremoniously dismissed from Netflix. Yeah. That, that format is so part of the Joel McHale persona, the Joel McHale we understand. Is it just a matter of time before it comes around again? Is it like Brigadoon, where we'll see you in front of a green screen before it's all said and done within the next five years? Yes, Brigadoon is the greatest analogy. Uh, <laughs> well played. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, believe me, I, I love, I loved doing it and, you know, uh, hosting is, uh, I like hosting a lot. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's one of those things where, I don't know, are they going to hire a 49 year old guy to tell jokes about, uh, clips? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but now you, um, look, you look 25. See, that shows you how screwed up your eyes are from hockey. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, I, I, you know, like, I always love doing it, so I always love hosting. Like, when we were doing the New Year's Eve thing, I was, like, three and a half hours live seeing, like, I was nervous, and then as soon as we started, I'm like, oh, this is super fun. 
and I had a blast. So uh, I, I'd done enough hours of it. So I, I better, I, I would love to. I, I always like hosting stuff. So uh, as much as I love acting. Watching you on New Year's Eve reminded me that I wish I had a Ken Jong in my life. We could, we could all be better if we had our own Ken Jong to, to guide us through. Yeah, he is one of my best friends and, and he, there's nobody like him. And uh, he just is one of the funniest people, A, on the planet, and B, he's smarter than all of us combined. Um, he, he's one of those assholes that's also an actual doctor. So uh, literally was, for 12 years was a real doctor. So like we, I focused on one thing for 20 years. I'm like, did it. And then he focused on, you know, becoming a doctor and then went, all right, I'll become the face of Fox television. No problem. Here I am. Starman, you are Sylvester Pembleton. Pembleton um, Dark the, Pearl is the name of the show, but right. I am. Starman. You're Starman. I mean, you're, you're, you're the dude, former star spangled kid. Uh, wow. Somebody did their Wikipedia. Oh no. I, oh dude. No, no, no. How dare you? This? this is not Wikipedia. I've got stacks of comics to prove my nerdiness. Bless you. Yeah, I, no. I reject that. <laughs> okay. uh, Jeff Johns, who is the nicest man on the planet, uh, asked if I would, die. you know, I only appear in the show uh, because my character got killed in the first episode. Spoiler, first episode, I die in the first 15 minutes. But And that, that first episode is nothing but fan service. Yes, a lot gets taken care of in that first episode no doubt uh but uh so uh so i do, i'm i go back and i feel like there's flashbacks and stuff and and i'm just happy to play because i've always wanted to be a superhero and i and jeff johns allowed that to happen uh and so i can't thank him enough and i'm 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 going am i going back i might be going you might see more of me we'll see uh in this season but i that cast is Caesar. that cast is fucking great. So well, it's a great wholesome all ages type show. Yeah, like, it, it's really one of those. It, it's probably tween focus, but it's one that I, as an aging man, can appreciate. Like this is this is just an entertaining, and like you said, the cast is fantastic. Yeah, and uh, Lee, what's her name? Breck, uh, Brecken. Uh, wow, Star terrible. Girl. What? Star Girl. Star Girl. <laughs> uh, I can't believe. Uh, sorry, sorry, uh, Star Girl. I'm this how drowsy I am. Um, she's amazing. She's like 21, and I don't think anybody older than her could do it because the hours that she puts in are bananas. Like she's she works 20 hours a day. It's very impressive. And and if I if I get six hours of sleep, I'm feeling it. And I used to. I remember when I used to just be like, I don't need to sleep today tonight, and then I was just go all the way to the next day, and it was fine. What were you doing when you were 21? <laughs> yeah, I was definitely not as professional as she was. Uh, I was like, pony keg or full-size keg? <laughs> mm. So, you know, you talk about hosting, you like that the most. Now, as dyslexic to dyslexic, go back to Seth. I think that President Trump, I think, is dyslexic. So sitting back and hosting like you love to do is that the easier way to dictate where you take the conversation as a dyslexic no uh no and i i uh i no i love you know i people always go like do you want to be a stand-up or a host or actor i'm like why can't i do them all uh i love doing them and uh so there's that but um yeah i've thought about like the way president trump reads and also how he doesn't want to read books yeah. i was like Sounds like a dyslexic to me. And um, uh, so, yeah, I, yeah, I, I mean, obviously there's a lot, a lot of other things going on with that guy. Yeah. Uh, I hope it makes sense. So to me, the, what he does. No, I'm not, I'm no politics. I'm Canadian. And uh, I just, as a dyslexic, I see a lot of similarities in me to him in defense mechanisms is, you know, is what I'm saying. Oh, well, I think his, like the thing I was talking about earlier about not being able to take a joke, that has nothing to do with dyslexia. <laughs> that, that, is, that is a fragile narcissist, uh, doesn't want his world to be rocked. 
or tapped at all. Uh, so, I mean, obviously, uh, I'm I'm not I'm not a fan of his, uh, but uh, but yeah, no, I mean, the, I'm, there's been so many famous people through the years that are dyslexic, and without some of this those reactions, you know. Uh, so I, I I see what you're saying, but. I don't even know if he knows he is. I don't know if he is. I just, I'm saying that I see similarities. All right. Well, you have empathy for human beings, but I don't know how much he does. <laughs> I, I, you know, I do. And that's why the, it's a prime example of why I started the foundation. I never want a kid to feel the way I do every day. Right. right. No, I'm just saying that that's different than President Trump. Uh, <laughs> that, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Joel, I, I was watching The Cabin with Bert Kreischer. Um, hey, look at that transition, everybody. James Van Oskel. Seamless. Keeps the trains on time. That's right. <laughs> you know, watching you interact with Miss Pat. Sup, Ryan, Creek, Ryan Seacrest. What's up, Lizzo? That made me laugh out loud. But it occurred to me that the comedy community seems very tight. It seems like everyone knows each other. It, it, it seems like the cross-pollination is all over the place. Is well... That, that was the first time I'd ever met Miss Pat, and the first time I'd ever met, uh, that was, a, I think I'd, I had met Burke Kreischer back in 2009, but we had had no contact since then. That's crazy. Uh, we had a watching little that, bit of contact. You'd have no idea watching that. Yeah, and uh, what's her name? Uh, Kaylee Kuko, who's such a nice gal, uh, and obviously very talented. Uh, I had had a couple interactions with her, but. Other than that, I have never really seen, ever, I've never spent time with any of those people until that moment. That's fantastic editing then. Wow. See? It's best friends. I mean, <laughs> so Bert, I mean, so I say that, but like, it's not like Bert and I hung out, but I, everyone's aware of Bert and obviously his success and his brand and how good he is. So you, he is one of those people that makes you feel included and heard which is a really wonderful skill to have and so he's one of those guys that you always want to be around so uh so I felt very comfortable and uh and I and so when he says my friends I was like he's not lying he I think he includes me and I, I can't I can't I love him for it can we ask you the obligatory Joel McHale question? Uh, how awesome am I? Very. We know the answer. Oh, yeah, we're legend. We're we already know you're a legend. That's uh, that's how we're starting the show. A lot of statues legend, being yeah. right, guys. So the obligatory question: community movie. Maybe. I mean, uh, I've said this before that before the table re read we did uh, back in June or. Uh, May it was I'm not sure I never thought I was I always told people yeah sure maybe uh, but I never thought there would be uh, but with the renewed interest of the show on Netflix and Hulu and, and every other streamer uh, Sony sold it to everybody and it seems to be doing all right that, that for the first time I was like oh maybe we could but we need millions of dollars so that's the problem there's the there's someone's got a you know any oligarchs that want to put on the community movie because that that would really help uh but yeah so I, I without any concrete plans whatsoever i am not as uh you know kind of like uh, hopeless about it i'm like maybe maybe it will who knows right if you got it happen after 2021. Like, well, but i know that brent doesn't have any money left <laughs> no, you know exactly where I went to the ex-wife. <laughs> there you go. See? Uh, now, that, now that we've moved past 2020, does Tiger King seem like a fever dream from years ago? Well, that was a thing that kind of fell into my lap because Ted Sarandos likes me. Uh, and I, or he can, I hope he does. Uh, but they just, you know, they made that offer. It was like two days before we needed to shoot it. And I was like, uh, what's go, what is this? And why? And they were like, we need this and this. And, and we want to do a fight. And I went, okay. And the pandemic had just happened. So I was like, I'm not busy. And, uh, so I watched the tiger King twice in like two days. And then it was very surreal to be talking to a lot of those people the next day. Uh, 
uh, or t literally I said, okay, yes. And then on Friday I watched everything twice and then we were interviewing everybody Sunday, Monday, and then it was out on Friday. <laughs> so that, that's how quick that, I think also Netflix wanted to get out, get under in before TMZ was releasing their own special and they had interviewed a bunch of people for it. So they wanted to scoop them. Uh, and we had Joe Exotic to be interviewed. And then there was a COVID scare at his jail. And I'm like, are we going to wait for him? And they're like, nope. And then we just kept going. And then I interviewed uh, Carol Baskin on during the, uh, the New Year's Eve thing. And that was surreal. That was the first time I'd ever talked to her. No doubt. All right, Brent, do you want to uh, take this home? Yeah, I know, you know, Joel, legend, you know, thank her. Uh, <laughs> so, sad. so sad. This is your definition of legend. It doesn't matter what my definition is, what's yours. It's all that matters. Legend? Again, serial killers, uh, Bilbo Baggins, sure. Frodo. Um, yeah, they got it done. They got uh, it. Zelda, the legend of Zelda. That literally has the legend in there. No. Mm -hmm. Um... No, I feel like a legend is somebody that has like, uh, you know, like is taller than a tree uh, or, uh, you know, they have a magical power, but, uh, or they may or may not have existed, which some people would agree that I don't exist. Like Dr. Fate, perhaps. Oh, well played. Well played, comic book <laughs> character. Uh, yeah. Wikipedia. You're a good man. I appreciate you taking the time. I know your kids are, uh, your dyslexic kids are staring at you wanting to go play football, so... Yeah, um, you know, I really appreciate you taking the time as, a, you know, another dyslexic, uh, uh, really appreciate everything you do for this world, your work, everything. You're a good man. Um, you know, stay safe with the family and, uh, you know, greatly appreciate everything. Nicely wrapped up. And I can't believe your grandfather and you're 44. All right. <laughs> How about it? All right. I'll, uh, so my, my 30 old, I got, uh, my oldest is 30. I adopted him. Peace. I adopted him when he was 15. Both his parents died six months apart. You're a saint. I would never do that. Truly a saint. That's, I would just like, I think I need a new car. That's how <laughs> my car I go. Like, I'm going to turn this car in and get another car. I had four kids and a vasectomy before I was 27. Wow. I would have too. <laughs> <laughs> Joel, thank you so much. It was, it was a real thank pleasure you, talking to you. Sorry thank I was you. late. Keep up. Take care. No, you're good. Let's do it again, and I'll uh, send you a land. Oh, it's over here. I'll send you a landline. <laughs> awesome. You right still on. have that thing? Thank you. <laughs> it still works. Thanks, Joel. Beautiful. Thanks, guys. Right. See Take you later. Care. Thank you so much.